welcome back to another episode of The Spotlight. I am your host, Gail Nicholson, miracle-making queen and host of The Spotlight, Three Crones of the Woo Woo, and uh, Tipsy and Tear, as we've got going now, too, on Fridays. And this lady that is my guest today here on The Spotlight will be providing a training in Tipsy and Tear as tomorrow. So definitely tune in for that one to watch because you're going to love to get a little bit more in-depth with what we're gonna talk about today. So, let me introduce to you Miss Lorraine regularly. Excuse me, I, my tongue just <laughs> wants that word to go on and on, and I chalk up another one for me butchering the, the guest's name. Hello, Lorraine, how are you? <laughs> I am good, thank you. And don't worry, no one ever gets my last name right. <laughs> it's actually regularly. Yes. yes. Yeah, and I, I, reading it, I see that, but the the tongue wants to go regularly. I know. Right? <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about, you know, what it means to be the conglomeration of all of your titles, author, entrepreneur, teacher, author's assistant, editor, you know, all in one little ball of sparkle that is you, right? How did all that come together? Well, um, kind of hard to say. I mean, I have so many different things going on, but it's just, it just goes to show you, you know, what multifaceted people we really are. You know, we have so many different sides to us that it's sometimes hard to just pinpoint one thing, you know, when people say, oh, well, what do you do, Gail? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's not just a one word thing like, oh, I'm this. It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm a whole paragraph of things, right? right. It's like, <laughs> what day of the week are we talking about here? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I am an author. I, I'm an English teacher by trade. So working with words has always been basically my passion is, is really how I, it can, boils down to. Mm -hmm. I love working with words, whether they're mine or someone else's. I've been called the grammar police on more than one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the editing portion of me. Um, but really, I just, I just love improving people's words and you know, writing, reading, anything to do with words. So that's why I created my business, that's offering awesome. word services to others. That is awesome. Um, now, here's, here's, I want to ask you about this because this has been a sticking point for me for a long, a long time, right? I'm, I'm a word wizard, word witch, whatever you want to talk about, you know, say as far as the title, but words have always been my passion too. And I grew up with, um, all of my siblings that I grew up with were at least six to 10 years older than me. So I knew words that my peers didn't know yet. And I actually had, I remember being like five or six years old and my best friend going, would you stop using big words, right? <laughs> Just stop it. And I'm like, no, learn the big words, right? And, um, but my point is, as I've, started to write my content and stuff for what I do and how I help people, I've heard many people comment back that you, you're talking way over people's heads. You're, you're too mm. intelligent. You're using too many big words. They don't get it. And from my journalism background, I, you know, they drill into you. People read at a sixth grade le reading level. I was just going to say the, the average person, like the, the, the majority of people um, read at like an eighth grade level, it, which is really sad, you know, that we have to sort of dumb down, so to speak, our language when we're communicating so that everyone can understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just like, yeah, it just depends on your audience. Yeah. Really. And it, for me, it, there's definitely some that I need to do that, but there's also a matter of these are advanced concepts you can't you can't dumb them down enough right to make well them exactly right I mean that's just like you know a, pro, a pro university professor speaking to their class like obviously you're in university you have a higher education you can understand the language better but if you take you know like the average scenario 
out in public with the masses. You know, that's why ads are written in such simple form. That's why, you know, you see basic language everywhere. And it's unfortunate because, like, like the preservation of the English language, you know, is, is really a topic that needs serious consideration these days. What with social media and all these short forms, that abbreviations that are used, mm-hmm. people don't know how to communicate effectively anymore. Yeah. And yeah, it's, that it's is really, really true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I noticed for myself anyway, um, like even in my texting, I am like, for example, it's, I've always been a stickler for which version of it's you're supposed to be using. Mm-hmm. Now it I cannot be the bothered comma. to go back and get the po- yeah. with the apostrophe in place. And I don't care if you misread it because you probably don't know the difference anyway <laughs> anymore. That's my like, that's how I look at the Internet. It's like I don't even care about <laughs> fixing the words the way I know they need to be because I know that you don't know. You don't care anymore. And that may not be true across the board, but like you said it's there's this very fast moving downward slope that the english Mm -hmm. language is being mutilated and yeah nobody's stopping and then you have to think too of the you know if you're actually reading or if you're listening like if because people are visual learners they're auditory learners it depends what type of learner they are right Mm -hmm. and for if you know how it's supposed to sound and you type it how it's supposed to sound, then in your head it sounds right to you, even though it may be spelled incorrectly. I mean, the biggest one that I see mis- misspelled, misused is your, Y-O-U-R mm-hmm. and Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, mm-hmm. which is you are with the apostrophe, right? Anytime you have that apostrophe in there, it signifies that it's two words. And if people would just remember that, it would really help them with their spelling. Like, really. Yeah. You know, it's funny, as you mentioned that, I recall back to the fact that my godmother was an elementary school librarian, right? So she's probably the one that, like, fostered my love of words. But she would tell me, like, for your, right, or for their, or whatever, when when you're putting two words together and you're eliminating one of the letters, right? That's when the apostrophe goes in there to, to take the place of that letter. And right. she explained it much more simply to me, but that made sense to me for the rest of my life, is that apostrophe mm-hmm. is for a missing letter. And right. then obviously you know which version you're talking about. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's amazing what what's going on these days. So in coaching, oh, and I want to go back to what you were talking about between writing things as they need to be said, right? Spoken word. We speak mm-hmm. differently than we write, right? Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. one of the other problems that I get into is that my writing, my typing, is very formal very formal and I come across as you know like this ice princess kind of thing right because I'm not talking with my hands and I'm not making stupid faces and I'm not you know kind of thing so what do you recommend that to people on on both sides of it that have been so structured in the English language that anytime they sit down to write they sound like some sort of oratory professor that's like the right to, yeah, just to make practice, that more comfortable. Yeah, just practice writing in a conversational tone. Okay. So pretend like you're only speaking to your best friend, not that you're writing for, you know, one particular group of people. Mm-hmm. You know, so where you're trying to, like, please everyone by keeping everything so formal and concise, you can just pretend that you're having a conversation with somebody and just write as though you were speaking to that person only interesting interesting and that and then that like helps. depending on who that yeah depending on who that person is will dictate how you write your words 
like if you're speaking to a child, right? So if you're writing something, you know, geared towards a younger audience, you can pretend like you're writing to, you know, your niece or nephew or, you know, child or like somebody of that age. Whereas if you're writing something for adults, you can just, you know, picture your best friend or picture, you know, one of one of your colleagues or one of your podcast guests or, or you know, whoever, and just gear it towards that person rather than trying to include everybody in it. Okay. That's a tip that might help you. Yeah, um, I'm not going to say that that's really the one that, that that would do that, that go for that. But um, because I'm in doing the formal languaging, I'm not trying to talk to everybody. I'm trying to, and this is what I'm seeing in, in what you're saying, I'm trying to get the information that I know across to you. I'm not looking at what is it that you need from me, right? Like, okay. so I'm trying to tell you this, 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 but I'm not taking into account at all from the reader's point of view, what can they receive? What can they, what do they want to know most and, and serving that person instead of serving what I want to tell you. Does that make sense? It does. So maybe consider exactly like the needs of who you're speaking to. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's another thing too. Yeah, um, and there's, there's a bunch of different tips that you can use, you know, when writing in a more conversational tone. I know that there's a blog post, a blog post on my website on wording. Well, mm -hmm. um, I had, I had a guest author doing a post about that at, at some point. So this, Google search write okay. in a, how to write in a conversational tone mm -hmm. or tips for writing in a conversational tone. But that's the key is that you want it to be conversational. Gotcha. So a conversational tone rather than a formal tone, okay. right? Or like a more, because you can still educate and you can still impart your information and wisdom mm -hmm. to people if you're talking in a formal tone. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a conversational tone rather than a formal tone. Like, you can still accomplish your overall objective. Okay. You just need to refine the way that you're doing that. And, you know, I think it's really fantastic that you've identified that you have, like, a little bit of a problem in that area because then that will allow you to be, you know, you're more receptive to suggestions on how to improve your writing or how to improve your method of communication because again that's you know that's what it really boils down to is communication and mm -hmm. so many so many people have problems <laughs> yeah yeah that is that is true that is very true so what do you where do you come down on um this which side of the question do you come down on when it comes to uh Verb, verbose or concise? Concise. Yeah. And for those that don't really understand what she just said. Okay, so for <laughs> verbose means very wordy, very, you know, lots of words, saying a whole bunch of things basically the same time, whereas being concise, clear, to the point. Um, what's that quote? Uh, brevity is... It's eluding me now. I'm having like a brain fog here. But brevity is better. You know, being brief, being brief and concise. Because, I mean, you can you can say things ten different ways, but you don't need to. Say it once. Say it clearly. That's it. Done. Yeah. Good, good advice. Good advice. When I was coaching, um, I would, we would, the participants would have, different stories about themselves that they had to tell. And it was so interesting to see where they would go from memorizing the script to where they inserted their story. And it's just a completely different style and they're going on and on and they're, you know, into details that aren't necessary and all of this because it's all personal experience. Of course, every iota of this is important, right? Um, but they would see their sales numbers plummet because they would be confusing the people they were 
presenting because they to. were including too much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So always, you know, always better to be concise. Those short sentences. Um, and and this is why editors are needed. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, <laughs> I'm an editor, but when I'm a writer, I am. I tend to be the more verbose type of writer where I include there's just like so much I want to say like I can remember writing something just a few months back about one of my clients who's a blind man but he is a podcaster an author an entrepreneur who has like several businesses he's a coach he's a motivational speaker he's a traveler who has zero fears about traveling alone mm -hmm. he is so many things and I wanted to I was writing this little write-up about him and I had to stick to a certain word count and I went so if the word count was this mm -hmm. mine was this and I'm looking at it and I'm like okay what do I cut because as an editor to you know if you if you're giving something like this and you have to cut it to this that's what you do. You cut yeah. things out. Yeah. That's just one portion of editing. Others is, you know, you know, fixing the words, the grammar, you know, looking for typos or, you know, alternate spellings of the same sounding word, mm -hmm. um, but spelled differently. So anyways, long story short, I couldn't edit my own work. I wrote this thing and I'm like, I don't know what to cut because I love it all. Like, I love, I love it all. My words are fantastic. I don't <laughs> want to cut any of them, right? <laughs> right, exactly. So I reached out to a fellow editor, Tina Morlock, and she, I said, look, I don't know what to do with this. Can you please help me? Within literally like 10 minutes, she sent me back the thing and she's, and it was perfect. Nice. She I looked at exactly what she did and I was like, thank you. I couldn't do it myself because that, and that's the thing with writers and editors. Like every writer needs an editor. Mm -hmm. Every editor, um, you know, does the same thing, but in a different way, but they can't edit their own work. Yeah. Like they can proofread it and stuff, but they can't, uh, when it comes to the cutting or, or shortening of things, it's really difficult to do because writers are, you know, they're so in love with their words and, yeah. and that's, you know, yeah. so as the writer, thing. I'm, I'm building you a world here and each little in, individual thing from my point of view contributes to the whole picture, right? That's right. But right. from your point of view, you can get that picture without, you know, the tchotchkes on the shelf. <laughs> mm -hmm. right exactly exactly <laughs> like things that are irrelevant to the main point of something mm -hmm. can be cut yeah and it takes you know it takes an objective look from an outside source in order to make those cuts that makes absolute sense yeah because see what's what's what you deem as mm -hmm. important is not maybe may not be what's actually important when you have an overall goal the same thing like I said you know with me writing you know all of these fantastic things about someone else and then I was like okay what what do I need to get rid of I don't want to get rid of anything and you know you when you're writing something you can you you basically approach it the same way right mm -hmm. if you're talking about you know describing your family or describing your home or where you live like all of these things will come into play but then you'll also include extra information that may be important to you but mm -hmm. doesn't really fit what the objective is and and can be cut out so yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense makes a lot of sense um I, I did a talk once for Toastmasters and I was talking about a particular incident right um uh, that I had um had to deliver a car to a friend up a long mountain road and when we got there we'd had an accident on the way there was a, a, a crack in the seam of the gas tank it, it wasn't a bad accident but it cracked the gas tank and when we got up there we waited for the car to cool down so that we could hang the muffler back up and then my friend got in started up the car and not realizing there was a puddle of gas right under the muffler 
Oh, and man. the car, he gunned it, the car backfired, and the entire car Oof. burnt. Up it did, flames. right? Yeah. So that's essentially the story, right? And I was saying that I did not see any places that I could have cut to, t- to my speech down to time. Well, there's a talk, there's a part of it where I'm talking about the uh, Norman Rockwell Musician or uh, Museum in Arlington, <laughs> Vermont, right? That's on okay. the way up there, right? Has nothing to do with the story. But so because... you just kind of went, went off on that tangent as you're telling the story, and it, it just had really nothing to do with anything, but you wanted to talk about it, yeah. and you know what, and that's, I totally can relate, Gail, because when I am doing that too, other things pop into my head, right, and I'll be like, oh yeah, and I wanted to tell you about this too, so you know, you see that, that line of success, how it's never straight. Yeah. It goes it goes up and then it goes like this and then, you know, over here and then a little and then more. It's like that's how that's how a lot of people tell their stories. Yeah. They go off onto these weird tangents, take a few detours, come back to the main point for a bit, detour again, and then keep going. And that's, you know, that's something that's really natural for us to do. Mm-hmm. Because when we're talking, things come into our head. And with our attention being focused on one thing, when that other thing pops up, we tend to be like, oh, yeah, okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. And then it's like, what was I talking about again? What was the point of my story? And then you come back to it. And then, I mean, how many conversations have you had with people that have been like that? Oh, absolutely. That's the way the human brain is built. And Mm -hmm. In the the work that I do with people in tapping and setting them free from their emotional hooks, um, I tell people about how you've got, it's almost like a spider web in your head. And if I say the word love, your brain is going to bounce around between the connected words to love. Mommy, daddy, marriage, hugs, kisses, valentines, whatever that may be. But in a person who grew up watching daddy beat the crap out of mom, I say love, they're going to say violence, pain, crying, tears, anger, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's the whole point coming back to what you're saying is when you're telling a story, right? And you're telling a story about the trip to uh, deliver the car and you're like, oh, in Arlington, there's this really cool thing. I, I, I love it and I want you to know about it, right? Because Arlington is Norman Rockwell. Right? It's not the mountain, it's Norman Rockwell. And if you don't have a connection between that Norman Rockwell Museum and the mountain, we forget what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's just how the brain is designed. And, and it, it also brings go ahead. up another point that we want to be relatable yeah. to people. Yeah. Like like you were saying, like that that connection. Like most people will have certain connections and so we want to be able to connect with people and bond with people and pull, you know, have that pulling of like an attraction, right? Like you, especially if you want someone to, to like you or buy your services or, you know, ask you into their own little circle of something like invite you or or whatever so we want to make those connections with people and it's really difficult to do unless we find those things that are relatable Mm -hmm. right like because we're all we're all human and we all have the same emotions and they we might not have the same experiences which is why we often use analogies and Mm -hmm. you know the comparisons but we all have those same desires and so that's what we want to connect with right right absolutely so um, when somebody like myself um, may have like an autobiographical book, right, that they're just literally like word vomit. Let me get this all down on the page and then we'll figure out what stays, what goes and, you know, what needs to be downplayed or upplayed. Where mm-hmm. do you come into something like that? Now, do you just take the book and go, and here it is? Okay, so <laughs> for that type of editing, that's developmental editing. Okay. And developmental editing looks at the big picture. 
right? And it involves what I was saying about the cutting, shortening something or, or whatever. Now, there's pros and cons to being an author in this day and age mm-hmm. because anybody can become an author and put a book up on Amazon. Mm-hmm. The technology, yeah, let that sink in. Anybody, mm-hmm. anybody can be an author nowadays. Yeah. Because the technology has advanced to the point where all you have to do is take your book file, take your cover file, put them up on KDP, which is Kindle Direct Publishing. You can either have a digital book, a print book, both, whatever. Now there's even audiobooks. Um, And you just put your files up there, you hit the publish button, you know, providing they meet all the requirements, whatever. And boom, within 24 hours, your book is going to be on Amazon. And you are actually offering, I just want to let people know, she's actually offering a guide that tells you exactly how to do that. So go pick that up. Yes, there is, (laughs) yes, it's, it's, um, it's. I got it. Wordingwell.com forward slash how hyphen to hyphen become hyphen a self-published author. All those are separated by hyphens Hyphens, on Amazon KDP. Yes. (laughs) It's on the ticker. Write it down. Yeah, because I know that actually was a blog post and I'm actually going to make it as a, as a little free thing. It's free. Obviously it's on my website. It's free, but it has an infographic. It has a video. It has text with the steps outlined step by step. So whatever type of learner you are, whether you're visual, auditory, you love reading, whatever, you can see all of the steps that are involved with that. And it's really cool that, but the problem, getting back to your question, the Mm -hmm. problem is that because anybody can become an author nowadays, there's a lot of garbage out there. Because they don't, often people don't hire an editor. And they just, you know, pile upon pile upon pile their words together and then just hit the publish button. And the book often makes no sense. Like, it might not have a proper structure. It might not be coherent. It might not be, like, organized in the right manner. It might be just full of typos and mistakes. And and as, as a reader, like, I know myself, the if I can't get past, past the first paragraph, if I see mistakes in the first paragraph, there is no way I am reading that book right. because I am just going to be cringing all the way through from all the typos because the association in my mind will be, well, okay, if they don't know how to spell, they obviously don't know anything, right? We jump to that conclusion. Even though it, even though it's false, because I mean, I've worked with a lot of talented writers and authors who need, you know, their maybe English isn't their strong suit, mm-hmm. but they have so many skills. Like IT guys are, oh my gosh, professional, like so <laughs> so crazy smart, but communicating on like a normal level to write something out, they can't do it. Which is why, you know, people need editors. So there's different types of editing. And what you were asking me is like the big picture, mm-hmm. right? You have tons and tons and tons of stuff to like sort through. And you have to make it sound coherent. So you've got this and this and this and this, right? Um, often people don't work with outlines. Often people don't work with the flow of Mm -hmm. like how one idea leads into the next, right? Um, Think back to math in school. You need to know how to add before you can learn how to multiply, Mm -hmm. right? You need to know that two plus two is four, four plus four is eight. But when you get to the multiplying, you need to have like those concepts already learned. So you have to have this step done before you can get this step done. Mm-hmm. And then in order, you know, to go on even further, you need to have these two in order to get to the next ones, right? And editing is basically the same way. Writing a book is the same way. Mm-hmm. You need to have things done in steps. Now, another type of editing, which is the more common, um, and they're often sort of lumped into two, like proofreading, Proofreading is they're, they're very basic, just checking checking for words, checking to make sure, you know, every sentence is capitalized, period, at the end of the sentence, 
or, you know, punctuation mark, exclamation mark, question mark, whatever kind of, you know, punctuation. Um, and that it, it, it just, it flows, right? Now, line editing, um, maybe you have some words that should be, like, flipped around in your sentence. Um, you know, some people put, oh, I don't want to get too technical with terms because some people might not know, but, like, some people will put, you know, words, we'll just keep it simple, words in the wrong spot in order to make it sound, you know, they know what they want it to say, but they don't have it actually saying what it should say. Mm -hmm. So just changing, you know, a few words around and making the sentence coherent is the line editor's job, like, or a copy editor, you a copy editor and line editor are basically the same yeah. thing. So, and a combination, my services, what I generally do, and this is what I do for the most part, offer the line copy editing, whatever you want to call it, and the proofreading all as one service. Right. So it's all like together. So I'll, you know, I'll check everything. Now, developmental editing, the overall big picture stuff, that's a totally separate kind of editing. And do so, you do and that? I, or I do you just, do you do stick with the Do you do that yeah. um, in some cases? For the most part... I have authors that come to me that their book's already written. They've either worked with a writing coach, um, maybe at the uh, SPS, the self-publishing school, uh, Chandler, Chandler Bolt Self-Publishing School, where they have, like, talented coaches that have helped them through every step of the way of writing their book, um, which I, I also do that, too, like, writing coaching, helping mm -hmm. people, you know, through each step of the way. But it's not something that I... I market myself as doing a lot because it's so time consuming mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very intensive process. Um, so by the time I get a book uh, from an author, it's already written. It's been through, you know, it's read by other people. It's maybe gone through a few of their friends reading it or beta readers reading it and giving them feedback. And they've already done their revision. And it's basically in final form. They just need me to polish it. Now, when I'm doing that, sometimes there's something that pops up that will be a developmental edit. Mm -hmm. Like, so say I get to chapter seven, and what they're saying in chapter seven doesn't jive with what with, with happened in chapter three. There's like a misalignment of communication. Like, if, you know, say Susie had, um, okay, here's, here's a really simple one. If Susie had, had green eyes in chapter three, and all of a sudden, she's got brown eyes in Chapter 7. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, wait a minute. Is she wearing contacts? Um, like, what happened? Are that you just, like, forgetting explained. about, yes. you know? And, and it's like, you know, <clears throat> most people won't catch those kinds of things. But um, so that's, like, a really basic example of, of, of a developmental edit that mm -hmm. will occur. Because, you know, if you're reading the sentence and the sentence is fine, oh, she had green eyes and, oh, she had, you know, she had brown eyes. Everything's fine and the sentence is perfectly fine. That's great. You know, the sentences can be great, but the mismatch of, of information is where the big picture, you know, comes right. into play. Um, and it's the same thing for, you know, whatever kind of scene. Well, if she did this, you know, over here and then she's acting a different way here, well, then that mismatch, if there's a mismatch of information, that's where like the big picture editing comes into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. Really cool. But usually, what it, so usually what will happen if I'm editing like a novel, for example, or you know like a like a big project, and I notice that there are certain things, like I'll warn people ahead of time, like there's an extra charge for developmental editing because, you know, it takes it takes more, right? It takes yeah. more knowledge. It takes, it takes more a different like sense keen, area of your brain of an awareness, too. right? So. Um, so, so what I'll do in that case is I'll I'll let the author know, like, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll count up at the end of the project. I'll count up, like, how many of my comments or suggestions or whatever were developmental edits and then just add on a little bit of an extra, extra charge at the end. Because, like, typically, like, proofreading, copy editing, that kind of service, at least for me, runs anywhere from two and a half cents a word to four and a half cents a word. Whereas developmental editing will run anywhere from five to fifteen cents a word. 
-hmm. And when we're talking per word, like that's a huge jump in the amount of money. So I like to keep my clients' costs down because not everybody, you know, just has money to throw around. So, and I also like to be really fair with them. Um, So I will give them the best price possible in terms of for what I do. Mm -hmm. But when those things do crop up, I do expect, you know, just like if you're going to, you know, a a mechanic to fix your car, Mm -hmm. if you need something done, you're going to go to the proper person, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on what you may need to be done, you'll have to pay for it. You might need an extra part. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be extra, right? So it's just, it's that kind of concept, but relating it to, to editing and what I do. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Um, well, let us know. We, we put into the, the identifiers for this broadcast how to reach you on Facebook, how to reach you on Instagram and on LinkedIn. Um, okay. And I just want to invite our viewers, definitely reach out and get that guide. I'm going to as well because that's a mystifying process to me. And God knows I've got stuff sitting around here that's literally just collecting dust, being a fire hazard in its current form. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. And um, what else can people look forward to from you? I mean, where can we find you? Where can we see some of your work? And um, how can they reach out to you if they want to work with you? So Wording Well is the name of my business. Wordingwell.com is the website. If you just search Wording Well, my name will pop up. Um, don't try to remember my last name because you know, <laughs> every, everybody doesn't get it right. So it's okay. Um, but yeah, wordingwell.com is where you can find me. I prefer email or Facebook as a way of contacting me. Okay. Um, feel free to re- reach out through Facebook Messenger or shoot me an email. Wordingwell.com has a contact page of all my social media, all the different, you know, everything. So if you just remember wording well, that's all you need to know. And I'm actually going to be, uh, I'm in the process right now of creating a course to teach other people how to become editors and do what I do. That's going to be the first course. Another course will be how to become an author assistant and help people with the process of, you know, getting their books up on Amazon, because that's another service I provide as well. So awesome. those are those are things to expect for me in the future, and hopefully more books too. I'm also working on a book of a uh, book series of poetry, um, an autobiographical series about my life. So tons, tons of things going on, yes. Awesome. Well, I wish you the best of luck in everything, and thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I can't wait to see you again tomorrow in the Tipsy and Tierra's group, giving us that one sheet bio, what is necessary, because the sheet that you sent me initially is like, oh my God, this is great. You need to do this for my group. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm so looking forward to that. Um, And any of you pop by, pop into Tipsy and Tierra's and and get this 20 minute training on specifically what you need um, to put out there to the host of any podcast that you might be invited to come on to. Um, Because Lorraine, Lorraine has got it dialed in beautifully. Um, All right. So thank you once again for doing what you're very welcome and being here. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Take care. Bye for now. When you open yourself up to actual energy work, makes that recovery progress so much faster. That recovery is possible. You do not have to live as a victim until your last days. You have unbelievable strength, and I know that because you're still here. Do you want to create something completely unrecognizable with your life? I can show you how. Thank you.